what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I am the host of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Ron Diamond. I'm going to introduce him formally in a second. Ron, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. Um, one of the interesting one lately, uh, the co-founder of Pixar on, he talked about kind of the inception of Pixar and um, just some early George Lucas stories, Steve Jobs stories. So check that out and many other episodes there. This episode is brought to you by Rise25 at Rise25. We help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships, and we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Ron, I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships, and I found no better way to give to my relationships than to profile them, to shout from the rooftops their story, what they're doing, what they're working on on the podcast. So if you haven't thought about it, check it out. Go to rise25.com. And I'm excited and big shout out to Stu Wolf, who's a business coach, certified EOS implementer in Michigan, fellow leader in Tiger 21 organization like Ron. So thanks, Stu. Uh, Ron Diamond is the founder and CEO of Diamond Wealth, which is a holistic financial advisory firm catering to the unique needs of over 100 single family offices, ranging in size from $250 million to $330 billion. Their company helps single family offices navigate the entire spectrum of investments and includes you know, advice on investments in private equity, real estate, venture capital. What's cool, Ron, about your company is you have an investment banking division, you have a private investment division, you have an environmental social governance division, and a philanthropy division, which actually is led by the former head of Oprah Winfrey Foundation's president of Crown Family Philanthropies, and you're also a chair of Tiger 21. So Ron, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. You know, what I love to start off with, and I've listened to several interviews, you also talk about a lot about giving value first. So I love to hear your philosophy because people think, well, you know, breaking, how did you break into this world of of family offices? Uh, It was a bit serendipitous. So Um, my background, I started, I graduated from Northwestern. I worked at Drexel Burnham when Drexel Burnham existed. And after two years, they imploded. And I'm in the room with people in their sixties and seventies and literally met, they're weeping. Many of them lost all their money. And my takeaway from that was I would always be loyal to people, but I would never be loyal to a company because if, if if that could happen to Drexel, it could happen to anybody. So I came back to Chicago, started a hedge fund, ran about 250 million for 10 years, sold it took some time off and started investing. So I got into the family office world. It was very serendipitous. And with the hedge fund, they didn't call them family offices. They would call them family offices today. They used to call them rich people. So there were a bunch of rich people (laughs) um, who are now called family offices. And that's kind of how I got into this space. So after I sold my company, I started making some investments. And I figured if I put in a little bit and I could get other people to invest more, I'll get better deal flow and execution. So that's basically what I started to do. And that's how I got into the business. And, you know, you all talk a lot about giving first and providing value. What are some of the ways that you've done this and thought about it throughout your, your career? Well, it's different. I think, you know, I'm 57. So I think when you're, um, you look at life through a different lens, I think when you're younger. So I didn't look at life through the same lens I do today. And I would, um, I, I did things a lot differently. Um, more myopic um, when I was younger. Um, I don't know when it wasn't a turning point or something, but um, I, I just realized that if you're going to, so many people are looking to receive, to, 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 to get stuff. And so few people are going to give. And I, you know, I remember one story, there was somebody who's like, I was talking to him on the phone and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with those people. And I introduced him to those two people. And he called me up. He's like, I can't believe you introduced me to them. I'm like, why? I told you I would. He's like, yeah, but everybody says they would and they don't. And I think the, the problem is that we live in a society where everyone wants to get. And at the end of the day, I'm not only altruistic. I mean, everybody's looking to get myself included. But in order to get, you need to give. And there's a term called a go-getter. There's also a term called a go-giver. And a go-giver 
is somebody who's really going out um, out of the way to figure out ways to, to help people. And it will come back in spades. I can't tell you how, um, but it, it always does. Um, so my, how I've worked probably for the last 20 years is usually when I do something that benefits somebody without any thought of how it's going to impact me, somehow, some way, somewhere, it helps me down the road. It just does. I can't explain it, but it does. Funny, because uh, there was a group call that was recorded and there were um, they were asking you, how do you connect with these family offices? And and you were giving them advice on, you know, giving, making introductions. And you said something that was, I thought, were interesting. You said, even if I have an amazing deal for them, I don't present it right away at all. Like, I just want to deliver as much value as possible and not even present it off the bat at all. Right. Look, there's always going to be great deals. I mean, there's always a, a fantastic deal that you need to be in. But at the end of the day, what I've done, how I've built my business, I've just surrounded myself with people that are smarter than me in various areas that I can trust implicitly. And if you surround yourself and you delegate, and if you surround yourself with people that are smarter than you in various areas that you trust implicitly, good things happen. So that's really how I built my business, just surrounding myself. And I did that. Um, you know, I'm now doing it. Uh, I'm on the family office initiative at Stanford University. Uh, again, it, it, it just um, figuring out ways where you could add value and then value comes back. It, it comes back to you. One of the things that you've talked about too in is family office space being a bit fragmented and providing value that way. Can you talk about that fragmentation, how you've kind of helped to solve it? Well, I don't know that I've solved it. I'm we're trying to solve it at Stanford, but what we're what's happening is that family offices in general are fragmented, inefficient, and siloed. So when you hear the term family office, everyone thinks it's something different. I was giving a lecture at Stanford. I had $5 billion family offices on, on a podium. And I said, what's the family office and why did you create it? And they were five totally different answers. And none of them were wrong and none of them were right. They were just different answers. And that's the, the area with this industry. So if you think about it, family offices, there's roughly 17,000 family offices in the world. And again, that's a ballpark. Um, there's roughly $10 trillion in capital. There's 65 trillion coming downstream from the baby boomers, the next gen in the next 15 years. So this market will be bigger than the private equity and venture capital markets combined. Having said that, um, most of the money, people who've got family offices, many of them, not all of them, but most of them are inefficient, fragmented, and siloed. Because think about it, where did they make their money? They sold Beanie Babies, they sold Guest Jeans, they sold Giorgio Perfume, um, Five Hour Energy, Chain of Gas Stations, and they have a liquidity event. It's a completely different skill set to do that, which is great, than to take a half a billion, grow it to a billion, not spoil the kids, do some wealth transfer, do some philanthropy, and grow the asset base. So you've got huge amounts of capital in what I'd call, in general, very inefficient hands. And the family offices, all of a sudden, they, you know, if 68% of family offices started since 2000, and half of those started since the crash of 2008, it's a new phenomenon. And since eight. 2008 until today, everything's gone up. Private equity, venture capital, real estate, Bitcoin. I don't care what you invested in, it's work. And family offices right now have one hand on their ear and one hand on their wallet because everyone, that's where the money is. And um, the, the problem is that they just want to be able to uh, talk to other families without being sold. They want to get real advice. So so many service providers, and again, it's there's nothing wrong with being a service provider for anything, but they want to sell them insurance. They want to sell them real estate. They want to sell them to their private equity fund. They want to sell them to their hedge fund. They want to sell them to their, with their, whatever it is. And they just, you need to, they need to slow down because the model doesn't work. I mean, only 20, what people don't fully understand is only 25% of family offices make it to the second generation, 10 make it to the third and five make it to the fourth. So the whole model, like everyone wants to be a family office, it doesn't work. So what we're trying to create at Stanford is an ecosystem whereby we can help. We're not, gonna, we're not a panacea, but where we can help these families network and collaborate in an area where they're not being sold product and people, and don't, people don't have other ulterior agendas. To me, when you say those numbers run, I feel like they should be bigger. 
like the transfer of wealth, that percentage, why, how, why is it so small and how can it people increase that? 65 trillion is not small. It's the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 5%, like you were saying, you know, yeah, that is small. Like, you know, when you get to the third generation, it's, yeah. So the the reason is several fold because what happens is when somebody has has a liquidity event and sells their company, what do they want to do? They want to invest in a cool cannabis deal or private equity or venture capital or real estate deal. What should they do? Talk to an estate planning attorney because without an estate, without pl- proper planning, nothing else makes it. It doesn't matter. You can make more money planning than you can investing. And people don't fully understand that. So the family offices that fully get it. They they're really in bed with their family with their estate planning attorney. That's the very first, second, third thing you need to do is get it structured. Without the proper structure, which is like the foundation of a house, it'll fall apart. And I think the reason is people are so focused on creating alpha, which is fine, making investments, and that's what I do, trying to find make money in private equity or venture capital and real estate. But they have to have the structure down first, and they don't. They're very myopic and they don't think about it long term. And the money's relatively new because this industry. Again, it goes back to the rock, way past Rockefeller and Vanderbilt, but most of the family office industry, the way most of your listeners have heard it, has been in the past 20 years. So it is new, and um, people are focusing on making money rather than taking a step back and figuring out how do I make it. And things like succession, next gen, impact investing, philanthropy, the soft skills, those are the skills that really help, not just picking out the best private equity deal. Yeah. So they're focused on the the sexy making money and not the foundational pieces. You mentioned the estate planning. What are some of the other foundational pieces that you're like, listen, before we go down this avenue, I'll find you the best cannabis deal out there. You need to put these things in place. Well, I think I always start with the estate planning attorney um, because you, you, you need that as a structure. Um, the estate planning attorney needs to be working closely with the accountant. So you really, you, what you really need to do is once you have had a liquidity event, you have to, you're a quarterback or you're a conductor. And as a conductor, you don't have to know all the tax laws or all the accounting laws or all these different rules, but you do have to know how everything works together. And what I tell people once they have a liquidity event is, look, you, you are now the conductor. Your estate planning attorney knows a lot more about you than estate planning. Your accountant, and he should, your accountant knows a lot more about you than accounting. But you need to figure out how things work together and you're quarterbacking it. And if you don't quarterback it and you let them lead, then the estate planning attorney is going to be fighting with the accountant. The accountant can be fighting with this person. It's your game and you have to grow this like a business. So most of the people who are family offices who've created the wealth, um, they built a business. Now, when you sell your company and you're worth a lot of money, in order to make it work, you have to, the family office, it is a business. It's not, I've got a lot of money now, I'm just going to invest. You can, I mean, you can do whatever you want with it. But if you want it to last two, three, four generations or, or further, you have to think think further long. So yeah. that's the main that's the main thing I focus on with people. So in the liquidity event, we'll call it the liquidity event team. Someone should have the estate planning. They should have a uh, accountant. Everyone's you know communicating together. And then also someone who helps run the investments. Well, too, even right? before the even before the liquidity event. So and this is the problem. So all these people, they're really good at making widgets, right? So they're good at making widgets and they sell their widget company. But what they should have done, and they didn't know about this because they've got blinders on, is they should have talked to an estate planning attorney probably a year before they even signed an LOI. Because once you sign an LOI, you set a value valuation of it. And then you can't do a lot of things that you can do with discount valuations that the estate planning attorneys can do. So in theory, what you want to do is educate these people before they even have a liquidity event. That's where you can get maximum value. Nine out of 10 times, what happens is people sell their company, say, okay, now I'm wealthy. Now I want to do estate planning. Well, Mm. estate planning can help you, but they could probably do one quarter of what they could have done had you spoken to them prior to your LOI. Love that. Yeah. And one of the things you talk about is with the investment piece, it's not even always looking at making the most amount of money, but there's a legacy piece as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, look, I think that right now, you know, we're, you call it a bubble. I don't know what you call it. All I can tell you is these valuations are insane. 
right? I mean, you look at private equity, venture capital. I mean, people are paying stupid money for companies. This will not continue forever. How long? I don't know. And the government can't afford to print money forever. So this is like, you know, I don't think this can last. So I think that um, what families need to do is figure out what do they do really well and what do they like to do? So let's say they made their money in real estate. Fine. They handle the real estate, but then outsource the other stuff. The venture capital, that's not what they know. The private equity, the cannabis, whatever it is, outsource the stuff you don't know or you're not that good at. Keep in line, focus on what you do know and you're really best at and grow it that way. And the biggest, I think, impediment many of these families have, truthfully, is the ego of the founder. And once you can get the ego, you, you can transcend the ego and you can look at it from the standpoint of, you know, yes, this guy knows more about me than private equity. It's not that he's smarter than me, it's just that he's been doing it, then things could work. So it, it's interesting. But when people say, well, who's the, your biggest competitor? Oftentimes I'll say it's you. <laughs> they want to do it themselves. They want to do it themselves. And they're, you know, you could be good at something. I'm like, look, you, when you built your business, did you do, were you in charge of sales? No, I had the best sales deck. So why are you going to do this any different? So it's just the way you look at it. And it, it's got to be looked at like a business. But if it's looked at like a business, you can really scale it. And it's fun because, again, this is so new. And right now, everybody's trying to get into the family office business because that's where all the money is. So banks are setting up family office divisions. Um, bench, uh, accounting firms are trying to set up. Law firms are setting up. They're all setting up because that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, it's you're only in the second inning. And I think my, my belief, my thesis at, at Stanford is that I believe that as family offices, as private equity and venture capital disrupted the public markets in the early 80s because it was a better model, family offices are starting to and will ultimately disrupt the public market or the private equity and venture capital because private equity and venture capital have become an AUM game. They just try to aggregate as much money as possible and they're making the money in the 2%, not necessarily the 20%. So there's an inherent conflict of interest. And what family offices have is something called patient capital. And patient capital, meaning they're not incented to flip a company every three to five years like the private equity and the venture capital firms are. So there's much better alignment of interest. And when I go back to everybody, I always say, let's look at alignment of interest. What, if there's alignment of interest, then everything can work out in the end. Without alignment of interest, somehow, somewhere along the line, something's going to fall apart. And yeah. that's what happened with private equity and venture capital still huge markets and I'm still a huge proponent of the industries, but in many instances for the entrepreneur, your partner is much better off being a family office than a private equity or venture capital firm. Ron, what I find fascinating is the different divisions of your company. And I'd love to hear about the evolution of services. Can you talk about were there certain ones that came first with divisions and the rest came later? How did the how did it evolve into the different divisions? Well, first was investing because that's what I did and that's what I knew how to do. But then as I started learning what family offices were doing, and then I kind of took a step back and realized, well, if only 25% are making it the second journey, why is that? So um, one of the things I found was, you know, philanthropy is really important. Um, not all, but most family offices are philanthropic. Some are extremely philanthropic. And, you know, my North Star is... You know, my, my father um, passed from prostate cancer at 57, which is how old I am, when my first boss was Michael Milken. When Milken went to jail, he developed prostate cancer. And when he got out of jail, rather than spending 100 million bucks at the, into a, the American Cancer Society, he built it like a VC fund. So people like you and me and all the male listeners will die with, but not of prostate cancer, primarily because of Michael Milken. So I don't think you can run a charity exactly like a business. And you look at what Gates did for vaccines, but you can run it more business-like. So my North Star is figuring out ways to take these family offices, these entrepreneurs who've created these huge companies, take that skill set and use it to solve some of the real world problems, be it climate, be it education, be it power, whatever it is. And I think that we can do. I love that. Yeah. And sorry about your dad. That's, that's uh, you know, thinking about the North Star in general for anyone is is really an important uh thing to do um last question ron i want to also before i ask it point people to where people can find out more online where should we point people to learn more about you you know i i don't really um i i appreciate that i mean look i've got a a website in 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 linkedin but um i'm not really looking for people to reach out to me so much I, you know 
that if I could add value, I, I'm fairly busy with everything that I'm doing right yeah. now. Um, so, you know, well, they could go to your podcast page, listen to some of your podcasts. And, I know my, uh, yeah. my, my, my producer would be killing me when he, <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got a podcast. Uh, the website is diamond wealth strategies. So Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go to diamond wealth strategies. You can go on YouTube and, and type in Ron diamond, diamond wealth strategies. He's got some amazing content out there in addition to, to this. Um, last question, Ron, you know, you are about giving when I hear you talk, you are about, you know, really connect, helping connect people. I love for you to talk about Tiger 21, your role there and, and kind of what you've learned through Tiger 21. I never heard of Tiger 21 five years ago. I was approached to be a member three years ago, and then I never followed up. And then about two years ago, I was asked to be the chair. Um, Tiger 21 is an incredible organization. And I, again, um, I never did YPO or Vistage because I didn't understand it. I even though a lot of my friends were in it when I was younger and they loved it, I just thought, okay, I, I know I do fairly well. I don't need to, to tell everybody how well I do. And that's kind of what I thought those organizations were. And I was completely wrong. Um, Tiger 21 is great because um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And I never understood the value of peer-to-peer -peer networks, but they're phenomenal. And what they do is nobody has an agenda. You've got, you know, I'm really good at this, but I suck at these four things. Well, maybe some of these other people can help me with the four things that I'm not very good at. And so what Tiger enables me to do is to work. It's like a personal board of advisors, and it enables me to um, talk to people knowing they don't have an agenda. They're not really trying to sell me insurance or trying to get me to invest in the real estate fund. They've got my best interest at heart. And you've got people that, are, that care about each other. And it's mind boggling when you get beyond the surface. You know, I've got a for the for my meetings, I've got the picture of the iceberg. People see the five percent. Okay, you live in a nice house, you belong to a country club, whatever it is, but they don't see the ninety five percent. What we talk about at Tiger is the ninety five percent, and that's most of it. And you'd be shocked about all these successful people who've gone through bankruptcies, who've gone through divorces, whose kids have gone through rehab, who are going through major health issues themselves. And by talking about it, it's cathartic and it's helpful, but it has to be done in a safe environment. So that's why. I, I'm a huge fan of Tiger. Yeah. Ron, I mean, the first one to thank you. Everyone check out, despite Ron shying you away from it, go to Diamond I'm not I'm, away. I'm totally, I'm, away from it. I'm kidding with you. Diamondwellstrategies.com. Learn more. There is a podcast page. Check them out on YouTube. And, you know, just think about, Ron, I want everyone to think about what's your North Star and some of your, what you talk about giving, giving to others and, and helping others accomplish what they want. So, Ron. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.